All right, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's episode of Double Line Minutes. I'm Sam Lau here with Mr. Mark Kimbrough. Hey, hey. All right, Mark. It's uh, just after 10 a.m. We're four days into the final quarter, final stretch of 2024. This is the part of the year where things just start to accelerate pretty quickly. We're just a couple, three or four weeks away from uh, Halloween. Then we have Thanksgiving and then uh, the, the rest of the holiday. So uh, it feels like uh, we're going to be in 2025 before we know it here. All is here. That's right. It's starting to get a little cooler, so I'm definitely appreciating that uh, here in LA. Let's jump into in the markets this week. Um, you know, it's a pretty uh, pretty noisy week. We had a lot of uh, important data points that came out. I'll save that uh, for you in a few minutes here. But the way that the, the equity markets responded, starting with the the S and P 500, it's it's just uh, just a little negative right now on the week to date basis, down about 10 basis points. The week to date, it's still up. 20 percent on uh, the year to date thus far. Right now, it's really a mixed bag in terms of uh, winners and losers for the week. You have about, um, let's see here, we've got uh, five in the green, six in the red here, but leading the way by a huge margin is the energy sector. That's up over 7% um, based on uh, the the conflicts that we're seeing undergo right now in the in the Middle East, uh, but by far and away that's the the best performer on the week. Utilities is a distant second, up seventy five basis points right now for the week to date. On the flip side, we have um, two sectors that look like uh, they're just kind of trying to decide if they want to close down over two percent on the week. They're just kind of at that line. Those are materials, consumer staples, as well as real estate. There, so just kind of the bookends of the U.S. equity market. Uh, for this week. Moving over to the fixed income market, uh, a lot to, to see here this week. Um, starting with the two-year part of the curve, we're ending the week 35 basis points higher in yield to what I see right now uh, coming in um, at 3.91% on the 10-year note. Uh, it's up 22 basis points in yield uh, versus um, previous Friday's close, and that's at 3.97. So just kind of eyeing that 4% mark there in terms of the yield. We'll see if it uh, crosses over through the end of the day, but uh, certainly it's within spitting distance next week, if not uh, this week. And then finally, rounding it all off with the bond here, the bond uh, 30-year uh, treasury is up 15 basis points in yield, uh, has a yield right now of 4.25. So what does that all mean for the broader bond complex. When looking at the Bloomberg U.S. bond aggregate, that's down uh, 1.2% on a week-to-day basis. Uh, it's still holding on to a positive return for the year at 3.52%. Uh, uh, looking across the complex, the only thing that's really benefiting for these higher rates is, I guess, you know, as you would expect right now, um, is the bank loan market. Bank loans up about a quarter point uh, week-to-day and everything else in the red. Uh, leading the way down are the interest rate sensitive parts of the fixed income market. Um, CNS, Treasury, and uh, investment grade corporate credit all down about 1.3% or so thus far on the week. Uh, but still a clean sweep across the all the various that we look at here within the bond market. And on the year to date basis, all of them are largely positive. Moving over to commodities to round this all up, uh, the Bloomberg Commodity Index is up 2% on the week, so the lone positive performer this week. Uh, it's bringing up the year-to-date performance to just under 8% on uh, that measure of time. Looking over at uh, the WT front uh, futures contract, uh, similar to what we saw in the energy sector underlying the S&P 500, a stellar week for those front month futures there, uh, also based a little bit of from the... Uh, news around Chinese stimulus, but also, unfortunately, the uh, uh, the conflict that we're seeing there in the Middle East. That put uh, the, that contract up over 10% on a week-to-date basis, bringing it back into the positive for the year-to-date of 5% positive uh, for front-month WTI futures. Looking at gold, gold's uh, just up uh, just a little bit under a percent right now. It's still shy of uh, 2700 on the front-month futures contract for a ounce of troy um troy ounce of uh, gold there it's right now it's at two thousand six hundred and uh, sixty seven dollars even uh for that front month contract there and that's for gold is up 29 percent on a year-to-day basis so with all of that uh kimbro do you want to kick us off on what happened macro front here again you know a lot of strong data points that came in a lot of important data points uh, that came in nonetheless so uh, why don't you kick us off on that 
uh, we'll do here. So you said it's, uh, this is jobs week. Uh, let's just dive right in here. We started uh, first data point of relevance was on Tuesday. We got the Jolts, op, uh, Jolts job openings for August. Uh, this printed 8.04 million openings. It's about 350,000 higher than the estimates and the prior prints. So right there, I'm just gonna say strong prints, but I do also wanna say it's kind of entertaining. I'm gonna go a little, just dive right into a tangent here, but it's entertaining to look at this sort of number through the different lenses we've seen over the last couple of years. I mean, for the last two years, we've been looking to see these numbers come down, trying to remove the, the wage inflation that we were perceiving in the market, you know, fear of too loose of a labor market resulting in uh, too much inflation. And now that inflation is now kind of on the Fed's back burner and the focus is more on employment, we flip our focus, we look at this through a new lens, and now we see a strong print, and that's a good thing. Um, so it's just fun how that, that can turn, uh, depending on what you know, how you're looking at things. Um, but yeah, for some context, uh, we averaged about 7.15 million openings throughout 2019, uh, the year before COVID started. So hey, we're sitting with an extra 900,000 openings right now. That alone sounds nice, the headline, but let's look a little closer. Um, Powell's referenced uh, the metric, the job openings to unemployed ratio. Uh, that's now at 1.13. Uh, the 2019 low was 1.14. So by that metric, we are tighter than we were at any point in 2019. So we know we've been rooting for this metric to uh, come down because it does reflect more of a balanced labor market. And uh, we'll see if that downtrend continues or you know maybe the, the Fed can help to rest some of this downward uh, momentum. I am going to dive even further since this is jobs week and labor is becoming even more of a focus. I'm going to go on something I've talked about here before, but this is uh, jolts, total hires and jolts, total separations. Intuitively, hires are hires, separations are when you leave the job, voluntary or involuntary. But if you take those two numbers and you take hires minus separations, that logically should get you to your net job growth. And over time, if you look at this metric through the history, I think it goes back to about 2000, you can compare this data. Um, it basically mirrors NFP, which is what you should expect. This is BLS data. But as of late, over the past year or so, we've started to see some deviations that uh, I wanted to highlight here. Uh, <clears throat> so let's take some, I'm going to look at this, this concept again called uh, you know, net job creation through the JOLTS report. Over the last two year, one year, and six month periods, this is at a trailing average of 249,000, 244,000, and 235,000 jobs. So, you know, a slight downward trend, but that's still a pretty firm job number. Um, it maybe feels a little weaker because we averaged over 600,000 in 2021, but that was, you know, that was an anomaly. Um, but while these net gains look solid and they're actually higher than what NFP tells us, uh, NFP has been averaging on a 12 month basis through August when this report was about 203,000. So, you know, we're short 30,000 jobs per month. It's a disagreement between these two reports. Um, so it's, it's just, again, reaffirming that this is a pretty decent labor market, at least from this metric. Uh, but I do want to talk about a couple of these jolts numbers. Uh, we have a quits rate, we have a separations rate, and a hires rate. Just think of these as the total number of quits or separations or hires over the number of employed. The, the hires is a little different on the number, but it's close enough. Uh, what we have is the lowest quits rate we've seen since June 2020 at 1.9%. You've got separations at 3.1. It's the lowest we've seen since March 2013. And a hires rate, we actually match with 3.3%. We matched that back in June, but uh, we're actually at the lowest level before that since April 2020. What I'm trying to say with all these numbers is uh, what we have is a job market that's still creating jobs, but it's become a very low turnover labor market. You know, it's low quits, low hires, uh, low separations. I mean, the fear is that the slowdown kind of turns into a snowball that, you know, turns the labor market over, but we're not there right now. And hopefully the Fed can help arrest that. So I'll leave jolts now behind. Thanks for listening to all that. Um, on Tuesday, we also got the ISM manufacturing for September. It printed 47.2, slightly below estimates of 47.5, and it was right in line with the prior month. No real movement here. Uh, I'm not going to stay on this report much. I mean, it's, you know, it's ISM uh, manufacturing. It's still broadly contractionary, and I'd say it supports kind of the, the weak manufacturing recession that grinds along. Um, on Wednesday, we got the ADP employment report for September. The early look to NFP that we do not give a lot of weight to, but uh, it did print 143K versus uh, estimates of 125. Again, we prefer to positive to negative, but we, you know, we'd rather look to the NFP report and the household survey that comes later in the week. Um, on Thursday, and be a little out of order with how this came out in the morning on Thursday, but we had ISM services for September. Uh, that printed at 54 spot nine. 
heftily beating estimates of 51.7 and rising from a prior 51.5. So again, while I want to focus on labor this week, I mean, this report does deserve a little coverage. Uh, it's the highest print we've seen since Feb 2023, and that was lifted primarily by two metrics. You got new orders rose 6.4 points to 59.4. Their diffusion metrics 59.4 implies that a net 9.4 of the uh, respondents to the survey said their new orders are rising. Um, it's the highest since Feb 2023. And you also have business activity and production rising by 6.6 .6 points to 59.9. Again, same concept, net 9.9%, saying their activity is rising. And that's the second highest print we've had since November 2022. Uh, last in this report, employment, unfortunately, did dip back below 50. It hit 48.1. But outside of employment, I mean, this is a solid overall report. Uh, and, it's, and it's occurring during a period when you can argue there's some uncertainty in the market that's restraining business activity, uh, specifically in the election that's coming up and, you know, with the uncertain rates activity. So, um, all in all, strong report for ISM services. Uh, also on Thursday, so earlier that morning, we got initial and continuing claims for the weeks ending September 28th and September 21st, respectively. Uh, steady issue drifts for this stuff, but really not much movement here. Get initial claims at 225K versus estimates of 221. Uh, that brought the four-week moving average right in line with what the print was this month, this week at 225. Uh, similar story for continuing claims. You had, uh, came in at 1.826 million, barely below 1.83 million estimates. There's 4K that uh, was not accounted for. And the moving average, again, is basically right in line with the continuing claims print we had. So uh, basically since that summer spike we had, everything settled back down. We should be aware of some potential impacts that maybe you're in the pipeline. You have Hurricane Aline. Uh, prior to last night, actually, would have said the port strike, but that now has been resolved. Uh, at least I think they kicked the can in January. And there's another, uh, it's less talked about. It doesn't come across my radar too often, but there's a machinist strike at a major U.S. aerospace company. Uh, I think there's 33,000 machinists or related jobs that kind of see the company, but they've, uh, they're have they currently on strike. And that stuff does have ripple effects up and down the supply chain in the events persistent. So. Um, and you know what, before we leave claims data, I'm going to address a comment we got from one of our listeners. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you, David, for the feedback. Um, it's almost always appreciated, uh, and it was this time, so thank you so much. Uh, but here, here's a quote from him, or let me paraphrase a little bit, but uh, he said that the comment was made that claims are elevated, claim by us, or comment by us, uh, claims are elevated versus where they were six months and 12 months ago. Yeah. You pull up claims on Bloomberg, they are at or below last summer, yet last summer we weren't talking about the labor market rolling over. So again, thank you for the comment, David. Thanks for sending it in. Um, let me dig right in here. Uh, I don't know if the reference was related to initial claims or continuing claims, but the meat of this comment is that the figures look similar to last summer on both these metrics. So why this summer are we speaking to risk of a labor market rolling over? <laughs> quick refresher, initial claims, summer of 23 and 24, we saw similar rises and falls. Whether you want to say that was seasonals or you know one-off coincidental disruptions, I don't think that's that meaningful at this point because they settled back down. Here we are. We can get back to that next summer. Um, continuing claims been on a gentle uptrend for two years, but you know we're about on the four-week moving average about 30k higher than we were last year. So I'll say that again, yeah, I agree with you. Not much has changed. So why concerns with the labor market rolling over? I'm gonna give you a couple, couple, couple things here. Maybe Sam, if you want to jump in at all here, but first one I want to highlight. The beverage curve. I know that's that's something that's been talked about here and there. It's, it's a historical curve that shows a relationship between the unemployment rate and the job openings rate, like the Jolt's figure. Uh, with the logic being, if you got a, an elevated number of job openings uh, and you have a loss of those openings, it has somewhat of a limited impact on the unemployment rate. For example, you know, you get 20 million openings and 10 million people looking for jobs. If you lose a million openings, it might not impact the unemployment rate that much versus you have 10 million job openings and 20 million people looking for them, that 1 million loss in openings really could have an impact on the unemployment rate. So you know, this, this kind of connects to that concept of the openings to unemployed ratio that Palo always references. You know, we're at 1.13 as of August, 2024, call that almost one person, uh, one opening for every person, and they're pretty close to balanced versus August last year, the ratio is 1.48. You had one and a half jobs for every person looking. So it's a much tighter labor market, which, as these numbers start to fade, you know, the, the, the risk rises that unemployment can start to uh, rise even more than it has already. Um, some other, you know, stuff we have unemployment rate. We, we've come a long way. We're 4.1% now uh, versus we were at a cycle low of 3.4 back in January 23. So 
uh, you know, as these numbers start to grow, I guess this this year alone, if you roll the clock back to when you gave this question, <laughs> we probably I think we had risen around 0.6% in six, seven months. That that you start to fear that that could continue. That snowball starts to roll, and uh, you know, labor market kind of starts to deteriorate. Again, the Fed is trying to to arrest that, but that is a risk. It's not guaranteed to happen, but it is a risk. And uh, last, the other one I'll talk about. I mentioned two ISM reports today. Those have been in contraction on the employment metrics. Uh, when you're talking to these different labor surveys that happen or business surveys, no one's speaking great about employment. So again, these the numbers are still we're still producing jobs, we're still growing, but you know that you can still keep your eye on risks that are further down the line. And it's you know, again, there are risks, not guarantees. Yeah, I think that's right, Kimbra. I mean, part of the reason why we've started to take a closer look at employment as well is because usually around this time in yeah, you know, in the in the hiking cycle, it's turning into cutting cycle. You know, after rates have been you know, restricted for for this long, you start to see it, it trickle down into the economy. And one of the way to to know this and you know think about how the strength of the economic activity will be going forward is through the labor market. So you know some of the key indicators that we've looked at over time that seem to point towards um, economic slowdown and typically you know being called a recession. Thus, you know thereafter is looking at the unemployment rate, especially when we look at it relative to its own 20, 12 month average, if we look at it relative to its 36 moving month average, whenever we've seen the unemployment rate on the, the headline numbers cross over um, their respective moving averages, that tends to be a sign of uh, economic weakness leading into the NBER calling it the recessions. And those, both of those, um, those uh, metrics have crossed uh, of late as well. So those are some things that we've been keeping an eye on. And then you start to, to look at the change in tone from the Federal Reserve itself, where they're starting to talk about the balance of risk being a little bit more neutral right now, where you know they're a little bit more comfortable with the the, the progress of inflation, but they now are keeping their eyes on the labor market. That also gives us pause for concern as well, and start thinking about how you know to to look at the numbers and dig under the hood as you just did there, Mark, on the uh, the labor front, just to see how um, the pulse of the economy is continuing to. To, to run, you know, based on the labor market. Well, you agree there. You know what? So now that we've talked about the risks of, of you know, the labor market and a little weakness, let's jump into today's uh, Friday blockbuster report um, where we have the establishment of household survey data. Uh, we had non-farm payrolls coming in at 254,000. That was 104,000 over estimates and 95,000 over the prior. Uh, we also got a two month net revision of 72K. Um, I don't think there's much to go into in the details of the non-farm payrolls report. It's pretty solid across the board. Um, so let's dive into the establishment report, the, uh, the where we get the U3 rate. I'm <clears throat> sorry, the, uh, this is the household survey where we get the U3 rate. Yeah. Uh, this came in at 4.1% unemployment. That was below estimates and the prior to 4.2. Uh, we also had a flat labor participation rate at 62.7%. Looking at the details, we can give you a few figures here. You had population growth of 224,000. You had labor force growth of 150,000. You had employed growth of 430,000, 430,000 people with new jobs. And unemployed people contracted by 281,000, loss of 281,000 unemployed people. So, I mean, some observations there. I mean, that's losing unemployed, gaining employed, having a growing labor force. I think that that particular labor force number, that's about 67, two thirds of the economy. Um, sorry, the labor of the increase in the population that joined the labor force. It's a positive thing. Um, it's over the last, let's see, four months, we've seen 781,000 increase in the uh, in the employed total. And we now have had back to back months where the unemployed total has decreased in that total 329,000. So all of this kind of pushed back a little dovishness in the market. The, uh, the expectation of more rate cuts. We're going to have plenty in sure to come, or I should say I would assume to come, but um, this pushback in some of the recent dovishness that built up, which is why rates backed off across the board. Um, and that's that closed up our jobs week. It was quite the week. Yeah, it definitely was. Um, one of the things is I will say that NFP was strong, and um, I did have an additional comment on that in the sense that it was pretty interesting to see, you know, today when Ryan Kimmel gave out his uh, his summary from our, our multi as asset uh, team over there and he mentioned that the two months previous data of non-farm payrolls was actually revised up by 72,000 so to me that was interesting just because if if I recall correctly most of the previous 
recent prints had been revised down. So it seems like at least the last two months are here starting to see a little bit of a reversal of that, at least for, for one uh, month's data for um, an upward revision. And that kind of just makes me think back to when Powell gave his presser most recently in September, he was talking about um, the payrolls data specifically being somewhat artificially high in the sense that he was also making reference of the of the downward revisions there. Um, so I always thought that was a, was pretty interesting, especially on the back of the fact that what was it about a month or a month and a half ago, Kimbrough, that we had the annual revision to the NFP data as well that came in saying that it was 818,000 jobs, or sorry, 818,000 payrolls rather, um, uh, being revised down over the, the 12 months ending March of 2024. So we'll see, uh, you know, continue as always, you know, we've been talking about, it. it's always important to, to take, you know, the, the headline numbers with a grain of salt, but to also check the revision. And I know, you know, for this, since we're kind of doing this labor um, jobs uh, episode here for David, I would point some listeners here, because I know you went through in pretty detail between the, the payrolls, the, uh, the jobs numbers, the, the unemployment numbers. For those who are trying to, you know, scratching their heads in terms of what the differences might be, I just pulled up our handy list here. It looks like, uh, Jeff Mayberry and I talked about the differences between the um, establishment survey, aka the non-farm payrolls, as well as versus the the household survey, aka the uh, um, the unemployment rate. There, we did this on episode nine of of minutes here, and that was recorded on April first of two thousand twenty one. So you can find that in our archives on doubleline dot com, uh, or perhaps through your your podcast providers as well if they take it that far back. But there, we just give a deep dive into the differences and how the, the surveys are conducted and how, you know, perhaps when you're looking at it, they're not exactly comparable and they'll tell you why. Nice to have those archives to rely upon. That's right. So with that, um, let's jump into the um, FedSpeak. Uh, rather than talking about the FedSpeak, I thought it was just interesting. We can just, you know, look right at the numbers here. It's uh since the jobs data came out today, we've really seen a lot of movement in the Fed funds futures probabilities here uh, for the the upcoming FOMC meetings. And just as a refresher, I just pulled up here the the last time we had our minutes on September 27th, last Friday's episode. The outlook for the remainder of the year in 2024 was for there to be uh, fully priced in 75 basis points of additional rate cuts. I have to stop saying uh, hikes. I was saying hikes a lot last week to clients, but uh, got in the cuts. We're, we got a transition here. So uh, 75 basis points of cuts priced, fully priced into the, the rest of the calendar. And that was as of last Friday. You fast forward with some strong ISM services data, some ADP data, as well as jolts and the payrolls and um, unemployment data. Now you're looking at two, or sorry, let's just call it 50 basis points fully priced in for the rest of 2024. Um, right now for the November meeting, it's just as I refresh it, we just have fully priced in one um, 25 basis point cut in November and then um, just over uh, about 13 percent chance for an additional. Um, uh, sorry, for a 13 percent chance of a 50 basis point cut in December. So it look, right now, just 50 basis points of total through the end of 2024 priced in. So markets definitely changed uh, as we've been told before in the past, the markets move every second. And we're certainly seeing that today on this, on this hot uh, jobs day. Hey, net net, that still gives us the four cuts that, you know, I think people are kind of expecting it just people got a little over, a little ahead of themselves. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. They're fighting the fed in a more uh, dovish way there. Right. I mean, yeah. the, the September summary of economic projections, they, the fed went from, um, having a 25 basis point uh, cut in 2024 from the June summary of economic pro projections to um, having four based on the September summary of economic projections. The market got a little ahead of itself. I was pricing in five uh, total uh, 25 basis point cuts. Uh, but now it seems to be going right back in line with uh, what the Fed is pointing out to, to 100 basis points of uh, cuts in total of 2024. Mark, that's right. So with that, uh, I'll kick us off on things to keep an eye out for next week. Uh, we have a couple of uh, pretty important prints here as well. So starting on Tuesday, October 8th, we have the NFIB Small Business Optimism Index um, that's expected to 
to come in a little bit higher than uh, the, the previous uh, period. This is going to be for the month of September. Uh, with that, that's an ever important number is it just gives us a, a sense of what the kind of you know, what we refer to as the lifeblood of the U.S. economy, the small, you know, the mom and pop stores, the small businesses um, in terms of their sentiment over over uh, this period of time. On Wednesday, October 9th, we'll get a, a little bit of a glimpse, you know, a filtered glimpse of what happened with the FOMC meeting in September with the meeting notes being released that day. Uh, and then on Thursday, we have the start of inflation week there with the CPI numbers coming through. Um, CPI on a month over month basis is expected to, to tick down slightly to 0.1% month over month, uh, down from 0.2% uh, back in August. That's on the headline number. And we look at the, the core part, uh, the core component there that's also expected to to decelerate slightly down to uh, 0.2% month over month down from uh, 0.3% uh, in August on a year over year basis. It's also expected to, to decelerate slightly down to 2.3% from uh, 2.5% in August. And then on the core basis, it's expected to right now to, to stay flat at a rate of 3.2% year over year for the core. And then on Friday, uh, we'll get the um, the PPI data, the pr producer price index, month over month on the headline. It's expected to also decelerate down to 0.1%. Uh, similarly with core, it's expected to uh, decelerate to 0.2%. Um, for the final demand, it's expected to, on a year of year basis, decelerate once again to 1.6%. And then when you're talking about the X food, X energy uh, core component on a year over year um basis that's expected to accelerate from 2.4% the period prior to 2.7% uh, annualized on the year over year for September. Uh, and then Friday, we have the University of Michigan sentiment indicators there, uh, both on just the consumer sentiment, but also their outlook on the inflation numbers there. And that's something that um, we do pay a little bit of attention to now as, as Paul has referenced it uh, several times and over this past uh, rate cycle there. But that pretty much wraps it up for this week, Mark. I um, want to thank everyone for for checking us out there. Checking us out uh, out there. Yeah, thanks to all the listeners. Uh, hit us up on X at DL Minutes or send us an email at minutes at doublelion.com with any questions, comments, or suggestions. Again, sure. thank you, David. Yeah, thanks for always sending in those um, those potential topics for of the week to us. Uh, we're, we're glad to, to tackle them. But uh, you can always find out more information about Double Line here at our website at doublelion.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you can find us there under Double Line Capital. You can always catch our latest insights in terms of our, our thinking here across our portfolio managers uh, at Double Line. But thanks again, everyone, for tuning in and hope everyone has a great weekend out there. Thanks all. Stay safe and cool.